going to talk a little bit uh, about the top part of Russell's circle here, kind of where the, uh, the, the tail of the snake meets the mouth, um, analytics and insight. And um, I'm going to talk about the most granular element of the, of the uh, content life cycle, and that's the keyword. Um, and the reason I'm talking about that is, and, and the reason that it's the tail meets the mouth uh, analogy is that uh, the key keywords are a big part of measurement, which is what I'll be talking about tomorrow using Google Analytics. Um, but they're also a big part for, for us at Mighty Bytes, my company, which um, uh, does a lot of web marketing, kind of the whole life cycle here, as well as building web infrastructures and web applications and, and websites. Um, and so we start and end with keywords. So you know, the, the first, we've been talking, hearing this morning about how you want everything to add value and make sure that all of the content you, that you create works for the users um, that are the, actually the, the customers that you're, you're working with. Um, and so when we work with our customers, we sit them down very first and foremost, and they may have a good idea of what their keywords are already and, and what people are using to search for them in, in search engines, stuff like that. Um, but we go through a long exercise where we spend a good couple, uh, good couple hours with them really diving deep, and, and, and we fill up a whiteboard with all kinds of words, and, and we put what they thought they needed um, on one side of the whiteboard, and we kind of work through over the course of the day, really kind of diving deep into all of these things so that they come up with a document that has a long list of, of, of options for how people would actually search for them online. Um, and then we start to prioritize those. Um, and we use those to inform the content um, as, that, that, that they will create as we build out the website for them. Um, so again, keywords inform everything. Um, they're, they're, they inform, for us, they inform everything on a social presence, a website, uh, uh, anything from like, you know, brand identity, mission statements, that kind of thing. Um, so we, again, start with a, big li a good list, um, apply that measurable keyword strategy uh, to, to the beginning of the process. Um, again, working with the content strategy and, and the customers in the beginning, um, we're writing all of this stuff down, what we've often found happens as we start to get into like a website development, um, that some of those things start to get lost, um, which I'm going to talk about a little bit. Um, this page here is actually an element of all the, all the areas where keywords are, are, are actually effective on a website. On the very top, you've got a, um, this is a, a keyword for uh, uh, Obama bobbleheads. Um, at the top, you've got the phrase that you're targeting. Um, on the page URL, you've got the actual uh, you know, URL structure includes those words. The page title is, as it actually includes those words as well, as does the meta description on the page, the page headline, uh, the body copy, the, the alt tag that's used on the image, um, all kinds of different areas where uh, your, your keywords are used within a page. So as marketers, we don't tend to look at this kind of stuff a lot. We just kind of say, here's our keywords, and we hand it off to the developers, and the developers are like, great. And you know, when we say we want a 2 to 10% keyword density on the page, you know, and, and we're going to be working with them, the developers are usually like, what, what, what? You know? um, and so what we've been finding is there's like a little bit of a, a kind of a, a, a loss of potential communication there um, as you go from marketing into the design and development of a project. Um, and if you lose that communication in the middle as you're building this website out and you're, and you're starting to you know, fill it full of content and your UX teams and your design teams and your, your development teams are not in sync with what you're doing, uh, you then can't really measure very well on the back end. So if you're actually trying to measure the performance of these keywords on the back end, once your site is up and running, you're like, okay, we've defined all these things, we've packed our website full of them, and we wanna see how they perform. If your site isn't built appropriately and not using some of these things, um, which typically are you know, input by developers, uh, you run the risk of not performing as well as possible. Um, so in terms of keywords, uh, you guys may all know this already, we typically break them down into two big categories, uh, broad term keywords, which are typically pretty hard to place as far as search engine results go. Um, so that'd be an example would be MP3 player um, versus long tail, which are much more specific. And uh, you know, in this case, iPod Touch 3G. Uh, and when we work with our clients, typically the folks that are searching for the iPod Touch 3G, they know what they want. So they, they're, they're more likely, they're already through the buying cycle, so they've already kind of entered the conversion funnel, so to speak. Um, and so we really work with them. You know, we'll come up with our broad term, terms, uh, keywords with them, but we work really hard to, to, to define a long list of long tail keywords. Um, 
And we start with the Google AdWords keyword tool. Um, that works very directly with Google Analytics on the, on the back end. So we use the Google, Ad Anal or Google uh, AdWords keyword tool to generate a list of suggested keywords. And that's kind of what we come to the table with when we're working with a client. And we sit down and we say, okay, these, this is this very long list. And the nice thing about it is it gives you search volume. So it says, based on what you're looking for, this many people searched on this term last month. Um, so it gives us an opportunity to kind of really gauge with them exactly what, uh, what, they, could be, what they could be searching for, um, as well as how competitive the keywords they want. If they want to you know, target MP3 player, they're going to have a lot of competition. So on the back end, you know, once we get everything up and running and, and, and moving, uh, we use Google Analytics to search on those keywords, and, or to, to track those keywords and track the performance. Um, I'm sure anybody, I'm sure everybody here is using it, right? No, yes, no, yes, okay. Um, what we found in uh, cl clients who come to us to build websites is uh, they usually come to us and say, put Google Analytics on my, on my, on my website. And then we sit down and, and talk to them about how they actually want to use it. And they're like, I'm just going to look at page visits and uh, page views and, and visits and stuff like that. So what we try to work with them through on, on the back end, once we get the, the keywords defined, the content defined, the website built, all that, all that kind of stuff, uh, is we work with them how to on, on, on tracking things that might matter a little bit more, like how many people watched your video all the way through. How many people downloaded your PDF? Uh, you know, just, uh, how many people signed up for your email newsletter? Um, all kinds of different things, and we help them track, you know, user progress through their site. So if they're if they're tracking donations, or if they're a lot of our clients are not for profit, so donation tracking is a big big deal for them. Um, so we help them work through, like, okay, a user is going to start on the home page, and then they're going to click on this one page, and then they're going to go to the next page, and with the eventual goal at the end of the of the, the user is going to make a donation. So we help them track that information so that they get an idea of how that path through the site is actually performing. Um, and then uh, we'll generate keyword reports after that. And we do this typically for, for not only for internally for Mighty Bytes for our clients as well. Typically once a month or so we'll generate a report, analyze it and cross-reference it with the, con the report from last month to see how these keywords are actually performing. Um, and if they're doing well and if they're actually driving traffic from specific places to the site and, 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 and how, many, how many minutes those folks are here, here coming in are on the site. Um, and we'll generate those reports and work with them once per month to sit down and say, well, these are our recommendations for improving this. You know, if your keyword is not working, then let's start targeting some new ones. If what you thought was really what, you, what was, what was going to bring people to the site and that's not happening, you know, then we're going to actually go to the next list in, in the stuff that we created up at the beginning. Um, and we'll target some new ones. And so we'll go back into the content and we'll start moving, moving the content around and, and actually putting new targeted keywords inside of it. Um, and then do the same thing the next month and say, okay, well, is this, is this performing better, worse, or not neither, either or? Um, so I want to kind of go back to what I was saying a little bit earlier. You know, we're talking about this big life cycle here, this big kind of secular process. I have a friend named Russ, and he uh, is a big UX guy. He writes books about UX. And he and I were putting together a presentation for Chicago Tech Week on content strategy and UX, user experience, where, where, that, where that overlaps. And so what Russ does is he goes into large organizations and he does a lot of information architecture, takes the, the content, moves it around, puts it, puts it in places um, that he thinks is the most intuitive for the, the customer that's actually going to be viewing whatever it is. Um, and then he works with interaction designers and visual designers to build layouts around that content. Um, when I was having a conversation with, with him about content strategy and how we approached it using keywords up in the front end and how that was a big part of it, he had no clue what keywords were. He really had no, and, and it was really kind of an eye opener to me because I thought, well, you're you know really well known UX guy. Why wouldn't you use, you know, why wouldn't you use keywords? And so we started kind of talking about our process, and it really, um, when it came down to it, it was really about you know the web team being in the middle and being this potential roadblock for for going from marketing, which is on the front end with all of the keywords and stuff, and marketing on the back end where you're analyzing your data that you're actually getting out of your website. Um, and we talked through a lot of processes where if had he known you know, that keywords were driving what he should have been doing, uh, again, some of that metadata as well as just you know, driving the content that he's creating and, and organizing it in a way that makes sense, um, he would have approached what he did completely differently. So um, I think you know, someone was talking about being from Silicon Valley. I think probably this is a very common, common thing that, that folks run into that the web team or the tech engineers or the, or the designers and the marketers are not necessarily speaking the same language. 
Um, and we've run into that at Mighty Bytes. We're a small team. We've got about 10 to 15 people at any given day. Um, and we run into challenges, even as a small little organization, doing this to making sure, making sure that, that marketing and, and, and the web team are on the same page. And so typically, the, the solution for us has been to make sure that everybody gets, like that the designers and the developers and the content writers come into those initial first meetings so that they are really clear on what the keyword strategy is for the tools that they're building. Um, and that seems to help a great deal and streamline the process as well. Um, so I got a little case study here. Uh, does anybody know what a B Corporation is? Um, it's, a, um, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a different way of doing business. It's short for a benefits corporation. Uh, Mighty Bytes is one. We became one in, in, uh, in June. In 2008, these three guys had this idea for a new kind of corporation that wasn't an S corporation, it wasn't a C corporation, but it was actually you know, still a for-profit business that had the idea, ideals of the triple bottom line, people, planet, prosperity, built into the bylaws of the organization. Um, so when you become a B Corp, what that means is that you know, things like recycling, sustainability, uh, you know, treating your employees right, uh, essentially you know, stakeholders trumping shareholders, uh, which is scary to a lot of companies, um, that's built right into the, the legally binding documents of your organization. Um, we've found it to be a great way to meet a lot of like-minded organizations and like-minded clients for us. Um, there, uh, what, in, in what started as three guys, three high school friends talking in 2008 about wouldn't it be great to have these kinds of companies around uh, have turned into this t almost $3 billion industry. There's 517 of them now, um, of, like I said, of which Mighty Bites is one, and there's only 11 of them in the state of Illinois. Um, so we have a small, closely knit community. Our legislation is going to the General Assembly this month with the hope of it actually passing legally um, in, in Illinois by, by the spring. Um, but it's a really great way to do business, uh, to solve social and environmental problems. Um, and when these three guys set out to do this, they uh, put their website together, of course, and you know, started to outreach to small businesses to say, hey, why don't you guys become, why don't you become a B Corp? Um, so like you can just kind of give, this gives you a lowdown of where the, where the B Corps are and where the legislation is pending and, and that kind of thing. So they, they, they realized as they were doing their outreach um, and they had their, their website and uh, their, their, they were focusing on small businesses and much like kind of what, what happened at the beginning of this is when people would start talking about B Corporations, they just got the kind of pinwheel eyes, just kind of glazed over like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, so they continue to, you know, they wanted to say, like, do we continue to build awareness and, and work with all of these small businesses that we've been doing outreach to? Um, or do we want to focus more on, on, you know, end consumers to actually educate people what a B Corporation is? Um, and so they decided, they, you know, they figured their hypothesis was that consumers wanted to learn more about B Corps, that small businesses, you know, would be interested, they should get a good foundation. Um, but they didn't really have any tools to figure out whether or not their hypothesis was really... Uh, was really working for them. So they started monitoring their keywords, um, and, and they actually started using Google Analytics. This is an actual screen grab from, their, from their, uh, one of their screens of, of monitoring. Um, and they found that uh, you know, the FDA, they used these over, over time, they realized that they needed to shift their organization's focus, that they really needed to do some more, some more core consumer outreach. Um, and they ran keyword reports, page views reports. They actually analyzed traffic patterns using Google Analytics. Um, and they found that people were searching on what is a B Corp, why do B Corps matter, and what is B Corp legislation more than they were on how to become a B Corp, for instance, and, and, and more small business focused things. So they, they also took their analytics data and they, they cross-referenced it with offline, you know, more offline data of the incoming calls that they were getting to their organization, the questions that they got, as well as other offline data sources, uh, the, the founders of B Lab. Um, actually travel around and they, they give presentations much like this talking about what it's like to become a B Corporation. Um, and uh, I was doing the climate ride, the New York to DC climate ride in spring and that's how I actually ran across them. Um, and they do great presentations and so they, they, they found that a lot of the uh, offline data that they were getting from their presentations was, uh, it was uh, helping them to kind of re re reassess what they're doing. So they completely turned their company, their organization around um, and they completely overhauled their, their uh, website and um, their outreach campaigns to first establish a solid number of B Corps in, in various states and then transfer their marketing to consumers based on the, the analytics data they got and then also doing the presentations and the education outreach. Um, and so far, it's working for them. They're, they're, uh, uh, Patagonia just became a B Corp two or three weeks ago. Uh, legislation just passed in New York and California, so B Corps are actually legal. 
Um, and I, you know, obviously, Google Analytics didn't drive all of that, but you know, it was it was a good barometer for them to say, well, how are we actually doing on on what it is that we're trying to accomplish? And that's all I got. Thanks. <laughs>